Hey, what's going on everybody? Chad Kalick here, and welcome back to the Intercrowded Room podcast for episode number 88, which we are going to discuss confronting the ghosts of the Flint Creek Ranch in Meridian, Texas. What is the Flint Creek Ranch? Well, it is a haunted uh, estate in Meridian, Texas. It's about two hours uh, south of Dallas, and I just spent the better of a week there, and the place absolutely blew my mind. And before I get into the details about all of this, I just want to be clear that although uh, several haunted locations have reached out before and you know offered to pay me to say that their place is incredible, uh, I want to be clear that the Flint Creek Ranch is not paying me for this podcast in any capacity. Uh, These are my honest thoughts about the place. Uh, It is a brand new location, and I was blown away um, by the entire experience. And uh, we'll start with how the place came to my attention. About a year and a half ago, we had played a sold-out show at the House of Blues in Dallas on the Sir No Face tour, in which I met this gentleman, Justin Ross. Uh, Justin was a fan of my work, came out to the screening, uh, you know, we met briefly and then he followed up on Facebook and, uh, just reached out and said, you know, I really love what you do. Uh, he knew a lot about my past. Um, I'm a musician. He's a musician as well. We had that in common. Um, he booked a lot of clubs in and around the Dallas Fort Worth area And he said, I'd love to bring you back to do something at uh, a smaller venue, something a little bit more intimate. So we did a show in Fort Worth. That was a ton of fun. And um, for about a year straight, he was pitching me on doing one of our Paranormal Weekend Retreats, which is uh, a four-day, three-night experience, uh, really built for those who are definitely into investigating and really kind of like, you know, locking yourself down to a location for several days to really get the most out of uh, paranormal investigating with a group of like-minded paranormal enthusiasts. Now, in order to do an event like this, you got to have a location that kind of has everything. You know, I, I like those events to be all-inclusive where you just got to get there and show up and we take care of you for the next three, four days. And then you just, you know, you're on your way when it's over. But once you get there, you stay there, you sleep there, you eat there. Around the clock, we have things scheduled, Uh, you know, we feed our guests, Um, you know, just like I said, all-inclusive, really just, uh, you know, baby and spoil those who uh, spoil us with the careers and the lives that we have uh, through their support. So he kept saying, literally for a year, he pitched this place to me, he kept saying, I know, you know, it doesn't have the name of Waverly Hills or... You know, these big places, he's like, but I'm telling you, man, this place is something else. And I know the owners and I think I could, you know, get them to do something like this. And I said, well, what's the story? You know, what's the haunted story? And he said, well, I recorded out there, recorded a record while I was out there. All kinds of weird stuff happened. I watched doors opening and closing and lights turning on and off. And he said he actually recorded uh, some EVPs when he was recording his album. Uh, a full conversation between two guys in a room in which nobody was there and he was convinced that the place was haunted well he also told me that the owners uh, his names are Mike and Jackie uh, two very cool people um, that they don't even live in this like 6,000 foot manor house that he said was just immaculate he said they live in uh, the smaller uh, guest quarters which is not even half the size of the house. And that caught my that caught my attention. I was like, really? Like they have this mansion basically and they choose to live in the guest quarters. And he said, well, don't get me wrong. He was like, the guest quarters are still pretty amazing. But the mansion, the manor house, they call it, he said, it is just unbelievable. And stuff goes to, on there all the time. And he said, uh, you know, Jackie had been uh, touched by something Uh, tapped her on the arm when she was up there and they've had experiences where they'll look at the top of the hill and different lights in the manor house will be on at different times with nobody going into the house for weeks on end 
Um, just, you know, a lot of, you know, I, I don't want to call it garden variety, but like, you know, standard stories that you hear about, uh, you know, positive, uh, you know, benign and non-negative, non-elemental, non-demonic hauntings. Just your, you know, uh, something is there. Something is co-inhabiting, uh, you know, this building. But he also said that, you know, weird things have happened throughout the ranch. And in addition to this manor house, he said on the property, there is also an eight person um, settler cemetery. Uh, we're back in 1813. Um, a family uh, had died and they're all buried out this cemetery out on the property. Um, he also said that there was uh, an original Pony Express like mail drop. Um, it wasn't one of the original depots, uh, just to point that out. Um, I, I had shot a video out there and I said, yeah, I'm at, a you know, this, uh, Pony Express outpost. And some historian was like, uh, on my page was like, it never went through there. And, and it was giving me a bunch of shit. And <laughs> after researching it, um, no, the main, the main, uh, outpost line, of the Pony Express happened north, um, but there were many routes for mail drops, and that's what this was. It was an old uh, Pony Express mail drop that was on Old Highway 6 out there, uh, which is super cool, because like in the middle of this field, you drive all these dirt roads on quads, and in the middle of this field, there's just like this old, like, yeah, like straight out of the Westerns, man, just this old like office building. Uh, so that was another haunted location. Um, <clears throat> and there was also a house on the property, uh, that was owned by the previous owner of the land and he passed away in that house as well. And that house is still there. So we're talking potentially four locations where weird things can happen on this one property. Uh, so when I first heard about that, I was like, well, that's interesting. I mean, most places you go to, you get to investigate one location. The idea of investigating four, uh, three, or even two sounded incredibly cool to me. Um, so, you know, we went back and forth, and, you know, Justin kept saying, I know you're picking places, I know you're picking places, but I'm telling you, I just think this place is, is something special. And uh, I still hadn't decided yet or made up my mind. Um, and we held an event at the Thomas House in Tennessee, in which Justin came out and we had one of those just all hell breaks loose investigations. And Justin captured an amazing photo of something that was in this old church at the Thomas house. And uh, once I got to see <clears throat> his passion for the paranormal, <clears throat> sorry guys, I don't know why I'm coughing so much right now. His passion for the paranormal, um, you know, I, I really started to kind of trust his opinion more. Um, that he was really into it. And, uh, so I finally said, well, let's, let's, let's talk about this. So, uh, you know, we all kind of got on the horn and, and, uh, figured out a date that would work to try to do something. And, uh, with the intention of if it went well, and if it was everything that Justin had promised me that it was, then hopefully, you know, in the future, it's something that we could, uh, foster and build and grow into a regular AGH um, event stop for our uh, weekend long retreats. So I show up um, right away. We show up to the property and yeah, it is stunning. Um, it's a property where they also deer hunt. So there's, it's a, like a professional deer hunting property. Like they own deer they raise deer they release whitetails on the land people come there uh, to pay to hunt and right away um you know i meet mike who owns the place he's a very very nice guy uh honestly kind of reminds me of my father in ways just uh you know not you know my dad's like a man of many words and he thinks about what he says and and uh you know, I like that about Mike. Mike just seemed to, you know, think about what he said. And he was, you know, very cordial and uh, just cool guy. I just really enjoyed him. And, um, you know, I met him in the main, I guess it would be the office of um, the estate, which is right next to the uh, guest quarters. But it's this, 
it's essentially his trophy room. It's this taxidermy room with all these, uh, you know, animals and deer and birds and things uh, that he has hunted. But what blew my mind is the freaking grizzly bear he has in there. First off, I never knew that grizzly bear bears were like 12, 13 feet standing up. I mean, this he's got a grizzly in there that's uh, stuffed uh, that he got in Alaska. It just blew my mind. I mean, this thing was massive. And uh, right away, I was like, yeah, man, we're in Texas, y'all. <laughs> you know, It was definitely not... Uh, uh, if you're a PETA fan and, and <laughs> you, know, you wouldn't have enjoyed it, but I grew up around hunters. I'm cool with it. Uh, it, it was it was really impressive, uh, and the property itself was absolutely gorgeous. Um, I had never seen so many whitetail bucks. I mean they they were when I say they were everywhere. I mean it was like being on a wild safari with just deer everywhere. Um, it was incredible. And there were dogs everywhere running around. This incredibly beautiful lake. I mean, this was so picturesque. I mean, straight out of like a Norman Rockwell painting. I mean, it was like, yeah, it was just second to none. I mean, absolutely beautiful property, beautiful land. And Justin says, let's uh, head up to the main house. Uh, this is the manor house. This is where we're going to be staying. This is where most, most of the activity happens. And right when we get to the top of the hill, like I'm talking right away, you just get that feeling. That feeling that I've had so many times where I'm like, yo, yeah, something, something feels off. Something feels, it felt like someone was, was looking at us. And I said, nobody's in the house. He said, no. Or Justin said, no. I'm like, God, you know, I just feel like someone's staring at us. He's like, from which room? Well, at that time, I didn't know which room I was staying in. Uh, I just pointed to the window. That made me feel the most uncomfortable. And Justin goes, well, that's your guest room. I'm like, you're kidding me. And he goes, no, that's the master bedroom. I was like, wow. So right away, we get in there, and I'm feeling just weird as can be. And Justin's, you know, telling me that he's going to go down the hill and leave me in this place alone for the night, which I'm like, that's not happening, man. That's not happening. I'm not here to convince myself or uh, to discover if ghosts are real. I know they're real, man. So you're not dumping me off in this house alone for the whole, <laughs> the whole night. You know, no way. Uh, so um, actually, Justin and I were going to both be playing music that Saturday night. Uh, so we decided that we were going to break the guitars out and do a little, uh, I don't want to say rehearsal, but yeah, I guess just play a little bit, get the voices warmed up, warmed up. Uh, so we played some tunes and we're hanging out and it's just feeling more and more odd as the, you know, <laughs> the darker it gets, the creepier it gets. So I'm like, well, let's, you know, let's do a little investigating, you know, let's do it. And Justin's like, okay. And we go up the stairs and we go all the way back to the back, like, northwest end of this property. And it's this room with two beds in it, and I'm on one, and he's on the other. And, you know, it's weird. It's been a while since I felt incredibly creeped out without anything major happening. And I I just, I felt, a, I, I did feel the presence of something, man, all the time. It, it just seemed like, there was always somebody watching us. That's the best way I can describe it. It just felt like someone was either always down the hall or listening to us or to the degree that if you would have asked me, is there somebody else in this house that you don't know about right now? And I <clears throat> have the option of betting money or not. I would have said yes. I mean, like it just felt like someone's here. And right away, you know, we're asking for signs of something's there. And, the odd thing about this place is when I say it was quiet in there, I mean, it was eerily quiet. Like, there was just next to no ambient sound. It was just so quiet. So when anything would happen, you would hear it. Uh, so as, you know, Justin and I are both kind of asking for something to happen, you hear these little tinky sounds, you know, here and there. But you know, I'm also... I don't know, it's a big house, we're on a ranch, it's windy outside. I mean, like, 
I don't know. I mean, like little tiny, <clears throat> little tiny things don't do much for me, you know. Little tink, tink, and stuff like that. It's just, it reminds me of that South Park episode where they're making fun of Jay and Grant. It's like, wait, wait, did you hear that? He's like, what, what? He goes, Jared, it went, it went. Tink. <laughs> you know, it was kind of like that, but we were kind of creeped out. And then, uh, and Justin started really getting creeped out. Where all of a sudden he was like, dude, I feel like something's by me. And, uh, and there's like the temperatures changed. It's gotten super cold over here. And, and I'm not experiencing what he's experiencing. I mean, I am freaked out, admittedly. Um, but I'm not experiencing what he's experiencing. And part of me is just going, what is wrong with this fucking guy, man? Like, why is he tripping so hard right now? And I mean, I knew I was freaked out. But I'm just like, there was nothing. I didn't feel anything happening um, on that level. Um, I'm not calling him a liar in any capacity. I've done this enough to know that we each have our own experiences, and that's just how it works when you ghost hunt. Um, so I suggested to him, let's go into to my room, uh, the, the master bedroom, uh, just because that's where I did have that feeling right away. And uh, I've been doing this enough now. I, I'm in no way psychic. I don't even know what that means. I mean, like, I know the definition of being a psychic, of course, but, like, I don't have the ability. So it's just... It sounds crazy to me that someone could hear someone or see someone or talk to someone because I don't have that. But I do have intuition. I do have natural, like, I get, you know, I, I can sense when something is off. And in that room, I could definitely sense that something was off. And I'm already naturally freaked out by the place. And Justin has me even more freaked out because he's way freaked out. And... I'm terrified, you know, <laughs> I don't even know why yet, but I'm just like, I was just terrified. I was so scared. And so I ended up sitting on my bed and Justin sits down on the bed and then we both decide, listen, dude, we're not going to go sleep in separate rooms. We're going to sleep in the same damn bed. <laughs> and this bed, thank God to be clear, this thing was like an Alaskan king. So you could have put six people in this bed. It's not like we were snuggling. Okay. <laughs> We were both just laying in the bed, and we had probably four feet in between us. Uh, so, but we're laying there, and you know, I'm asking for a response back and forth, and little things are happening, but nothing that I would call definitive. So then, finally, I say exactly that. I just say, "Listen, if you are here, I need to know. Like, this has to be definitive." And Justin was like, "That's right. It just has to be loud. Give us a striking sound." And he was like, just do that one time, really loud, uh, you know, so we know you're there. And I said the same thing, you know, just one time. Here we go. And I said, I'm going to count down. And, uh, you know, I count down the three, two, one, zero, wait. And I mean, like three seconds after I counted down. Bam! Like right in the room, just loud as shit. I mean, it sounded like something... Thick and metal hit something hard. Big bass bottom end, but a high pitchy ring. And thankfully, uh, you know, Justin had uh, his recorder going. And I will get this uh, EVP audio and I will include it on my Facebook page, uh, which is facebook.com forward slash uh, Chad Kalick. I'll put it on my forward slash AGH Chad Facebook page too. So be on the lookout for that, as well as a bunch of other evidence that I'll be posting from other attendees in the coming week. Um, but for the story's sake, yes, this happens. Uh, I jumped through my effing skin. I was just like, holy Jesus, that was loud. That was definitive. That was, I got you. You want to know it's me for sure? Here I am. Uh, you asked for it, you got it type of thing. And, you know, right, I want to keep going right away. And Justin's freaked because, A, this just scared the shit out of him. Plus, he said, if you do it again, then I'll stop asking. So he feels like he should stop asking now. And I, I, didn't, I didn't want to. I wanted to keep going. But I was like, yeah, but he doesn't want to. And I'm up here with him. And I get it. You know, it is what it is. It's cool. So... You know, we're basically just going to chill there and just fall asleep and wake up the next morning. And I can't get to sleep. 
I mean, I am adrenalized, and I still feel like something is in that damn room. I just, I felt it the whole time, the whole time. So then finally, finally, as I'm just falling into like deep REM sleep, I can feel it in my bones. It just feels so good to be falling asleep. I just hear Justin scream, Jesus Christ, what was that? <laughs> I come I come out of my sleep, man. And I started climbing on him, the wall, the bedpost, like like an animal on fire, man. Like I had no idea where I was at. I didn't know who Justin Ross was. I didn't know what building I was in. <laughs> it was straight sleepwalk panic. For a good five to ten seconds, I was losing it. I literally had no idea what was going on. And he freaks as it turned out, and I didn't experience it. I didn't see it. He said that every light in the house simultaneously flashed on and off. Like everything, just poof, it went on and off. And I would have given anything to experience it, but I, I did not experience it. But I, I trust him. I mean, I, I, his reaction was so incredibly authentic. And he was tired as hell at that point, too. He was dozing in and out. And that was my first question. You know, did you, you know, did, did, did you basically dream this or are you sure? He was very sure of, of what he experienced. And yeah, I mean, it just, for real, for five seconds, I was in absolute blood curdling panic mode because <laughs> I, I didn't know what was going on. I was in such deep sleep and it just scared the living shit out of me. Um, so eventually, uh, the sun comes up, um, the whole vibe changes, uh, the place just feels incredible. And uh, I know very soon our guests will be arriving. So one by one, our guests arrive. And I have to be honest, I've done so many of these events. And no matter how cool the location is, I, I firmly believe that it's the guests that make you know the events special, right? Because you could be somewhere incredibly cool and if just a bunch of dickheads show up then it's not fun right you know so uh you know people start showing up and there's new faces and everybody knew that i met was extremely cool uh you know there, there's a re repeat and return attendees that you know uh half of them i consider family you know we've done so many events together now and and it was just it was just really awesome once again to you know be in the company of friends and to make new friends and um you know the group that that comes to these events uh, there's always enough people there that i know from past events that they really carry forward the vibe and welcoming new people and opening up right away and making sure that everybody feels like they're at home you know and uh, that's what's really special. And that happened right away, the fellowship and the camaraderie. And and it was just fun. It was just, you know, it's cool to, to catch up and to talk about life and, you know, to talk about the paranormal and everything outside of it, just normal life, you know. And and because uh, people always ask me, what are these events like? Normal people, you know. It's not like, you know, Egon shows up. Then there's Ray, you know, and then there's Rick Moranis and, uh, the gatekeepers here, you know, I mean, it's just normal people. Like I said, there's doctors, you know, lawyers, uh, you know, uh, there's electricians, there's musicians, there's masons, there's, I mean, it doesn't, it's all just people, man, just people that are interested in what's on the other side. And uh, <clears throat> it was cool. Uh, there was an incredible group there. And we decide that night we're going to split it up into basically three different groups. And we'll start out where one group is in the manor house. And then, uh, you know, Mike, uh, who who owns uh, the Flint Creek Ranch, was kind enough to arrange for us to have two six-passenger quads. So um, we could run one of the quads uh, with six people out to the cemetery and then one out to the uh, Pony Express mail drop um, or the depot. And... They're quite a ways out there. These dirt, like I said, this property is 3,900 acres. And 
these locations are spread out as far as you could possibly be spread out from each other. So you got to take all these crazy, uh, you know, backwoods, dirt roads, roads to find these locations. And the whole time, I mean, it is truly like you're on safari. Like, I, when I say that there was a lot of deer, I mean, they would they would jump like like how they just, I mean, forgive me, I'm not a huge nature guy here. But I was just blown away how the these big whitetail bucks, you know, 10, 12, 14, 20 point, whatever they are, just huge, would prance. They would like jump like in, in this incredible incredibly fluid manner they could just jump so high and they were so fast and they would just i mean jump feet in front of the quad that i was driving and then in the middle of the night you would stop and you just take your flashlight and you'd point it to the field to the right of you and you would see like two dozen just eyes light up in the dark and it's these massive deer that are you know scoping out what we're doing you know i mean it was it was unbelievable i mean it was literally like being on safari and there's every other kind of creature there there's this uh incredibly cool dude that comes to our event come to our events his name is michael wilcox and he's way into nature he can identify everything you know he was going for these nature walks and coming back with like you know the scorpion in this bottle and this beetle and and this type of snake, and he knows what they all are and where they're all from. I mean, just fascinating, man. I could hang out with Mike all day and do that stuff. It's just really cool. Um, <clears throat> but it was. It was like being on safari between, you know, uh, you know, all the big animals, and then there's, uh, yeah, there were snakes, and there were spiders, and there were, you know, it was just, I felt like a kid again. It was so much fun, especially driving these quads around in the dark and everything with six people on your quad. I mean, it was just super cool. Um, so we split up. We had a team at the, you know, the Pony Express Mail Depot, a team that was at the uh, cemetery and then back at the manor house. And I started with the manor house group and nothing really happened for us there, uh, which was interesting. And I'll get to why that was interesting later. Um, but we swapped out and we went out to... Uh, the uh, cemetery and the temperature just dropped like crazy. It was so cold. I mean, it was like high forties, like maybe 50. I mean, it was in really super cold for somebody who's not acclimated. And I remember I was just freezing. I mean, I was absolutely miserable <laughs> when we got there because my hands were so cold, but everybody was so excited. And I see why, because you get out there and you're out in these spooky woods and there's this full moon and there's these old broken headstones from 1800s and the craziest thing started happening. We're talking, there's nothing out here. There's no wiring. There's no nothing. Everyone has their phones off. Everybody like the, it's, it's, there's nothing out there that should be setting off, you know, millimeters and K2s. And sure as shit, man, things started happening around these headstones. Uh, they, they had these, uh, these trigger objects, these uh, little balls that if any kind of pressure comes up against them, they'll just set off and start making these lighting sounds and beeping sounds. And there was no wind that night. I mean, there was no wind. It was so calm. But yet these the trigger objects are firing off and the K2s are firing off and pretty soon they're capturing EVPs. And I was like, this is absolutely fascinating that none of this electrical equipment that they're using, it should all be rendered worthless. You know, you, one would think, you know, because I, I always feel like those things are just, you know, reading you know, energy that's in the air, whether it's a microwave, a phone, a radio, a plane zone, whatever, and people are just kind of matrixing. That's how I always kind of feel about a lot of those little audio equipment devices, whether it be a K2 or a millimeter or any of that stuff. Um, but I, I, I got to tell you, you know, out at this cemetery, none of that stuff should have went off and none of it should have worked. But I'll be damned if it didn't. I mean, I was really blown away. I was like, man, this needs some more research. This is fascinating. I'd love to believe there's a reason why all this stuff was reacting, but maybe the reason is exactly, you know, as advertised, you know, it's haunted. There's 
uh, spirit say there's energy there, uh, you know, both residual and intelligent. And uh, it was pretty fascinating. Um, but thankfully for me, by the end of that session, after being out there for so long, it ended up being there like an hour and a half rather than an hour, it was just getting cold for everybody. And we were going to head out to the Pony Express Depot. And I actually got us lost. And that sounds like, well, how could you get us lost? If you saw these winding roads, especially at night, everything looks the same. Everything's a fucking dirt road, man. Everything is just woods and a dirt road. And I kind of knew the way out. I didn't want to get too far deep into this 3,900 acres because we're talking on CBs, and this, which was fun as hell, by the way. Um, but the CBs can lose battery and go out any time. And I'm thinking, man, the last thing I want to do is get us lost on a freezing cold night on a haunted property with no way to communicate with anybody. Not what I want to do, especially when there's, you know, white tail bucks that are bigger than my, <laughs> bigger than the entire quad that I'm driving. They're just, mo you know, meandering right by us, you know. Uh, so thankfully, my group is like, hey, listen, actually, I'm pretty cold. Can we attack this during the day tomorrow? And head back to the manor house, and in which my response was obviously, "Say no more, we are outy," you know. So we bounced back, and and you know went and hung out, and and uh, everybody kind of shared their stories, and and everybody was telling me what had happened, and uh, there were a ton of EVPs that were captured, and people were going to be cleaning them up, and they played some for me. Um, you know, like just putting the recorder up to my ear. Um, but I know uh, even right now as I record this, they're still going over uh, their footage. And there's been a ton of awesome, awesome evidence captured. Um, some incredible EVPs, which like I said, make sure that you follow me on Facebook and on Instagram at AGHChad on Instagram and on Facebook. Again, that's just dot com forward slash Chad Kalick or dot com forward slash uh, AGH Chad, and I'll make sure I get all these EVPs up. Um, but it was like, yeah, cool night, uh, in which everybody afterwards retired back to this. There's this fire pit, and uh, everybody just kind of shared stories, had a blast. Uh, you know, Justin ended up breaking out the guitar, uh, had a great time hearing him play. He is truly, truly a world class musician, and. If you think I'm like just saying that because he was kind of good, you know, talk to anybody in the comment list below who went to this event and asked them how good Justin Ross is. Uh, they will tell you he is one of the best to ever do it. Uh, this boy can rock uh, the kind of bluesy country unlike anybody I've ever seen before. So that was really cool. You know, we all kind of hung out. Everything was all good. Uh, you know, the next day comes, and again, everything's all good. Kind of go through uh, the same drill. We're sharing, uh, you know, the evidence that we've captured. And I got a chance to talk to uh, Mike and Jackie Moore, kind of about their experiences and what's been going on um, with their family. I don't know how much to speak about over the podcast and what was private and what wasn't per se. But needless to say, what I did learn is that, you know, Mike's father had passed away and he was the gentleman who had built uh, the house. It was his property. This was his estate, like everything in it. This this gentleman, you know, uh, worked his butt off for and, the, you know, clearly would have taken a great pride in his ownership of something this spectacular. Um, and basically, you know, Mike and... Jackie are wondering, is it possible that maybe Mike's father, the spirit of Mike's father, would still be in that house? Uh, you know, which I said to them, well, you know, I, I can't make, you know, an assertion yet because I don't know. We've only done it a couple nights, you know, and I was still getting more and more information out about the place. And and I said, but let's, you know, let's, let's talk. Let's let another night go by and see what's up and let's talk. Um, now, remember, as far as the activity goes, it's things like lights coming on and off, tapping, um, and little little things. You know, nothing violent or crazy, little things. And uh, so I'm like, let's see, like I said, what tomorrow brings. So, uh, you know, the, the next night comes, and 
you know, it's, it's Friday night. Everyone's, you know, excited to go out and do it again. Thank God it's not as cold. So we all get a chance to go out and investigate each location again. And I just want to say this, Jackie, that food was incredible. Nothing makes you feel more like your home than a good down home meal. And the meals were amazing. And every night it just, you know, you get your dinner in you and you're ready to go, man. I mean, uh, so it was cool. So, uh, you know, that night we all go out and investigate. And I end up again having a larger group in my room, which we had recorded the loud bang and the, the response. And every time there was a large group, like nothing happened. Every time there was a large group, nothing happened. But every time you would get it back down to like one or two people, then it seemed like things would start happening. Now, typically when that happens, that just lets me know that we might uh, have a child spirit. Uh, in my past work, child spirits do not like large crowds. They like it when it's one or two people. And it's probably the same as a regular child. You know, a, a large crowd can be frightening. Um, and I think that does relate when it comes to spirits of children because... I got the whole time the feeling that like a lot of this stuff was mischievous. Uh, let me, you know, let me touch you here. Let me poke you here. Let me shut this light on and off. Let me, you know, flush the toilet when you're in the shower. Let me shut the shower light off when you're in the shower, which happened to me as well. Um, you set your keys down, turn back around, they're gone. You know, like stuff like that. Mischievous stuff. And so, you know, after kind of experiencing that, you know, I talked to, um, you know, Mike a little bit more as well and Jackie some more as well. And through multiple conversations, I learned that, well, not only were there children out at the settler cemetery, but there was this legend of a boy on Halloween who dressed up as, um, uh, how is it? First nation, native American Indian. And basically something went wrong and this child ended up getting shot and killed and it was just a horrific accident it just happened and that started to make more sense to me the settlers children the fact that out of the eight people that were buried out the settlers uh, cemetery i think like five of them were children um and i got the feeling that there were child spirits um, but i also did get the feeling that there was also an older spirit that was trying to make me uncomfortable like the, the stuff that I experienced the first night, feeling someone's with me the whole time and watching me, that didn't feel like a child in any capacity. I mean, that felt like somebody who didn't really want me there, didn't know me, you know? Um, and that would have made more sense if it is the dad, because this is his property. Who is this guy coming in and sleeping in the main you know, room that was his and bringing all these other people in with him uninvited uh, in accordance with the old man, right? So, um, what I was thinking the whole time is, I have a pretty good idea, you know, that uh, it's the father to some degree, but I'm really leaning towards the fact that this could in fact be, you know, multiple spirits, not just one, but, you know, uh, some residual energy because the house is also made out of all this crazy material that shipped from all over the world, from old churches, um, from old bars. Like, you know, there's definitely some residual stuff going on um, and little sounds and things that you hear over and over again. But what I felt more than anything is, okay, I could see cause and reason as to why the father would be trying to intimidate people or freak people out to get them to leave. But this other activity just doesn't seem like the father per se. It seems like like I said, a child wanted to mess with you. Well, that night, um, there's some people staying up drinking, and I don't drink, and I was exhausted. So when we were done investigating, I just tucked it in. I was ready to go, ready for bed. And I'm laying down, and right as that happens, this lovely woman, D. Watts, from Australia, flew all the way in from Australia, which uh, is amazing, D. My friend Brenda also flew all the way in from Canada. So we have people literally from all over the world coming to this event. Uh, but D wakes me up at like 5.30, and she's like, you know, you got to wake up. Where are the ghosts? When are things going to happen? And 
it was hilarious. I mean, she had been drinking a little bit and she had a nice buzz going and I was laughing and joking with her and just going, D, you know, you can't control it. It just happens. And, you know, we get in this long conversation about life and everything else. And, you know, she's doing her, when's the activity going to start? What's going on? What's going on? Where are the ghosts? And right as we're talking and this again, God as my witness, I swear on my daughter's soul. Something just kicked our door in. The door just, boom, just opens up. And then the light switch gets thrown to the main room because the only light that was on was the, the, the lamp by the bed. The main light was off. So we both look at each other like, what in the fuck was that? And we go sprinting as fast as we can over to the door to see what's going on. And I look all the way down the stairs, and I just see Justin basically walking outside to have a cigarette. And I was like, yo, dude. And he looks at me lost. And he's like, what? I'm like, you did not just kick my door and turn the light on? And I'm, you have to I'm asking a rhetorical question. I know he didn't do it. Because in order for him to do it, you have to get all the way down these old wooden stairs that are like 100 years old. I mean, they creak if you just blow on them. I mean, had he kicked the door open and turned the light on, we would hear him. You know, and Justin is also like 6'7", I think. Like 6'7", 300 and some pounds, a big boy. So there's no way he's like moving about the manor as the dainty hoofed Justin Ross. You know what I mean? Like he's going to, you know, there's no way we're going to hear those heavy footsteps. And he didn't have nearly enough time that it would take to get to the bottom floor in time. And that to me really felt like children it felt like d was just giving me you know a hard time but where's the ghost where's the ghost and almost like daring them and then that happened and it really felt like a child spirit to me but it it man i'm telling you it blew my mind because there was just no way anybody could have done it and once i really kind of sunk in of where justin was at below it really just confirmed that there's just no way there's no anybody could have done this and it felt very childlike in nature just like yeah like a ha ha basically like you want to prove you got it type of thing and uh it was mind-blowing you know um but essentially we had an incredible time and when i got a chance to kind of listen to everybody's uh, you know evidence their own personal stories uh you know as i told you know, uh, everybody there and Mike and Jackie, I, I, I do believe to some degree it's the father. And I do believe that there's a child spirit there. Uh, I would have to spend more time there to really get a solid idea that I would like take to the bank. You know what I mean? But like basically, you know, given the few days I had out there, what I experienced and the time that I spent out there. I do believe Mike's father is haunting the place. I don't think he likes company in there. I don't think, not Mike from his father. I don't think he likes company in there. I, I don't think he likes anybody doing anything without consoling with him. I definitely think it's a, a cohabitation thing. Like it was just something he did not want to part with yet. Um, I think that's a very real thing. Um, I do think there are children there. Now, again, I'd have to spend more time, but that was my initial, you know, thought of the whole thing, um, is that, yeah, I would have to spend more time there. Um, but the last night there, we had a chance to go play some live music for everybody. Uh, I haven't played in a while and, uh, I basically opened up for Justin Ross, rightfully so. Uh, I had a blast doing it. I thought it went well. And then I thought, Justin's set was, like I said, as good as I've ever seen. I mean, and, and I've toured everywhere and seen everything, man. I'm telling you, it was mind-blowing. Absolutely mind-blowing. Um, had an amazing time again. Had an amazing time back at the fire pit hanging out. And uh, I just felt fortunate. I felt fortunate to have the chance to not only be a paranormal investigator, but the author of the lore and legend that will forever stand as, you know, the first documented stories of a group of people that came in and attempted to answer, you know, questions for uh, the owners about what's going on. And I, I think they felt really comfortable with it. Uh, you know, I did. 
And I'm telling you guys, you know, if you're anywhere near this place, uh, you know, I, I don't know yet if, if uh, you know, Jackie and Mike want the business of people consistently coming to investigate or not. That's, you know, it, that's their private uh, decision. Um, but uh, something tells me that, you know, we'll be returning there. And when we do, man, this is a place that you just have to come see. It's highly active. It's absolutely stunning. And uh, I'm really glad I went. I'm really glad I went. I'm really glad the people uh, that were there got to enjoy this and become part of the history of this incredible state. And uh, it just felt good, man. It felt good to, you know, just be involved in something again that just, you know, gives me a lot of excitement to do. And they do it with a lot of cool people. It was very special. It was very special. So um, my verdict, yeah, man, it's haunted. <laughs> you know, <laughs> straight up. You know, too many things happened, man. Too many things happened that were unexplained. And they consistently happen in the same, under the same type of parameters. Meaning, like, if there's a large group in the room, nothing's really happening. But if you break those groups down and start putting only two or three people in those areas, everybody recorded something. And uh, there's a reason for that, right? So it's just, it's just figuring that out, you know, why would that be that way? And I, also, I acknowledge that a lot of this is just pure guesswork because you don't have, you know, guaranteed documents yet of a lot of these legends. So uh, if I had more time there, that's one of the first, thing I would, first things I would do is really start trying to see how many of the, the legends I could corroborate with research. And uh, something tells me I'd probably find out quite a few of them. Uh, so, yeah, it was really amazing. And, uh, you know, I hope you guys out there listening right now, I hope you're able to join me on an event uh, in 2020. We have five paranormal events that we'll be announcing throughout the, the year. Um, there's always something uh, for everybody. You know, we do enough different locations and uh, with different styles of paranormal events and, and you know, uh, there's always something for somebody. If you're into it, we have something that you'll think is cool. Um, but I just want to state this again, man. The coolest thing about it is the family atmosphere and that nobody has to feel stupid about, you know, asking a question, sharing a theory, you know, or just, yeah, just basically throwing it out there. Hey, this is what I think. What do you guys think? Um, at the end of the day, the fellowship is what makes it special. Um, it's it's just super cool, man. And I remember leaving, I think, uh, a sign as to whether or not you had a good time is if you wake up the last morning and you kind of feel that separation anxiety, that sadness inside of you, you know? And I felt it in a big way, in a big way. So... Uh, to Mike and Jackie, if you're listening, you know, thank you for allowing AGH to be the first to ever come on uh, your estate and investigate. And, uh, you know, I'll put together all of our thoughts, Mike and Jackie, uh, for you guys. Uh, so you have a document as well beyond our conversation. And for those listening, if you are interested in joining us uh, in 2020 at one of our five forthcoming events, um, just email me at tpechad at mac.com and let me know to put your name on the waiting list and I will. And, um, you know, whenever we announce something, you'll get an email about it. But an amazing time was had by everybody. Um, you know, I think it would be awesome to go back there knowing what I know now. I want to thank everybody who came. I want to thank all of you guys for listening and hopefully in the future there'll be a lot more done there. Uh, because it's most definitely a haunted location. So thank you all once again for listening to episode number 88 of the Inner Crowded Room podcast. And I promise you, I will be back tomorrow with more. All the best.